Ready to go live? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Happy not Friday. Wednesday. Yep, it's a Wednesday. Yep, good to see everybody. I'm uh, super excited about tonight. Um, I have met a new friend and um, who I find super fascinating. And, you know, in our world, um, well, in particular, my world, because I'm, you know, I'm a guy, you know, we tend to think about things like beans, bullets, and Band-Aids. And um, very rarely, I think in most males' cases, do we think things, you know, like yeast infections, UTIs, and pregnancy, and right? Babies. And babies. And and then how to deal with all of that. And so I'm so excited to have Jessica here with us tonight. And Jessica is a uh, combat midwife. She's trained over 50,000 first responders, special operation forces, and combat medics to deal with uh, early childhood and then uh, girls issues in a combat environment. Well, that directly relates to us guys, because you know what? Someday we may be in a situation where the only people we can depend on are ourselves and knowledge is power. And unfortunately, this is not a topic I've given a lot of thought. And so uh, without for further ado, I would like to introduce Jessica and let's everybody uh, make sure we welcome Jessica in, right? Because we don't want her to be all like all nervous or anything, right? Even though she won't be, but, but anyway, I'll welcome Jessica. Jessica, hello, howdy, how are you? Good evening. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course. Well, I know that I probably didn't do you justice in the many things that you've accomplished in your world. And I, and my audience knows this about me. I love and have a special place in my heart for Freedom Warriors. And um, I interview them a lot on my channel. And so I'm super excited to have you. But if you wouldn't mind, just kind of tell everybody a little about you so that, because again, I probably butchered it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't butcher it, but um, I, I'm a paramedic and a midwife who's been training military for a lot of years and have a pretty intense EMS background. And um, I've delivered babies in all sorts of environments, everything from out of hospital to Afghan refugee camps to in between. Yeah. And I could not even imagine, you know, you, were, you talked to, you did an interview with uh, Eric from Porterhouse until a few days ago. And you were talking about women throwing babies over barbed wire fences in, you know, Afghanistan. And it really made me think a little bit about, oh, my goodness, we have totally neglected this spot in our preparedness and in our life. We really have. Yeah. We just haven't given it. I just never really thought of it. And um, so I think it's super cool, yeah. you know, that you're in here. She um, said babies, band-aids and bullets. Yeah. Babies, band-aids yeah. and bullets. Yes. That's right. Yes. 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 And before we get started, do you know what a woman is? Just a curiosity? No. <laughs> I, I, I do. Um, I do remember a lot of them. Ooh. Yes. Jessica, I'm sorry. I could not help myself. I just couldn't do it. You had to. It was, yeah. it was, it was already wide open there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, I'm being asked, where is it you live? And if you don't mind sharing the state in which you live in. I'm from Texas. From Texas. We have a lot of Texans tonight in the house, so you know. Woo! As we always do, go Texas, right? Perfect, yes. Do you do classes in Texas or anywhere else? I do classes for, all over the country. For non-military members? I, I travel all over the country for all of my courses, whether it's EMS, military, or mm -hmm. or civilian. It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, I travel all over the country. I live out of two suitcases and a backpack. I'm pretty efficient. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, first question that I got for you tonight is, you know, when you're talking to someone like me who really hasn't prepared a lot for this type of thing, right? What advice would you give somebody from the beginning? What are some things from the beginning we should be doing? Well, we should reestablish what men and women are <laughs> in our culture. Uh, secondly, we should understand that even if we don't, even if we're not maybe in a family environment and we we're not preparing for a family, we should still be thinking of these things because you never know who's going to wind up being on your property, your front door, um, also barter and trade. That's really cool. So having, um, you know, a really great OB kit, uh, selfless pun and you know just kind of throw that out there but having something that you can be able to no matter what have the bare minimum essential needs for for delivering a baby and then what are we on three now uh the other thing is just stop being afraid of of ladies business it's mm -hmm. it's really not that scary um 
I say this all the time to women, a, a yeast infection, a bacteria infection, whatever in the vaginal canal is really no different than having a sore throat. It's warm, dark, and wet. And it's just a different location. The concept of the infection is very similar. And so if you kind of have that mindset of it, it really wouldn't be any different than going to the gym and not wiping your stuff off and you got staph or some sort of weird infection on your knee. Um, it, it, it's just a different location. Are there some nuances? Sure. Um, but really, if you can kind of take away the taboo-ness away from it, I don't know if that's a word. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, but if you can take the taboo away, then it, it really is not that scary or hard to take care of with some basic, very, very basic education and probably a few things from your kitchen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you said, I noticed uh, in, in a, another video I watched of you, you talked about having things in the kitchen. What are those things? <laughs> so some basic herbs. And knowledge of those things, um, uh, I know. I know B and I are gonna bond over this, but just basic things like herbal remedies, essential oils, having some really basic for medicines, natural, non-pharmaceutical medicines in in your kind of bag of tricks. Most of those serve a lot of different purposes. But even everybody in, in this room probably has a clove of garlic in their kitchen somewhere in the refrigerator or in the pantry or whatever. Hopefully it's like non-GMO came from your garden. Um, but even if you don't have that, it'll it'll do the trick. Um, but a clove of garlic as a suppository will 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 kill a yeast infection. So really? that's some pretty, yeah, some, I, I know it sounds funny, but yeah. it, it it will work. Um, the body will naturally purge it out in the morning. And, um, you know, we're all adults here. So if you were to, to catch that and smell it, the, the garlic would smell like infection because it's, pu it's pulling it out mm -hmm. of, of the body and, you know, 10, 10 to 14 days of that. And you're, you're, you're good as new. So, so I, should get I, mean, a I should get a catcher's mitt. You don't need it, you know, it'll it'll purge itself when you go to the restroom in the morning. So it'll take care of itself. But I was just saying, if you wanted to, you could catch it. <laughs> the catcher it's meant. This is we're already, we're it's, already going good. it's good. It's good, right? Yeah, you, you know, I think one of the best uh, therapies there are is laughter and having fun. So absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think it's good. Well, babe, what um what kind that of was actually one of the things that I had written down too, because I had heard her say about um, you, you basically have, or everybody here would probably have like eight or nine things yeah. that you could use um, yeah. from the kitchen that would help with a multitude of things. And yeah, so garlic would sure. be one of them. Yeah. <laughs> garlic would be one of them. Some pretty basic essential oils. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, some, some basic essential oils, um, some different different herbs that you would probably already have in, in your repertoire of treating other injuries and wounds, that those would work for that as well. Um, I usually love tea tree suppositories, which you can very easily make in coconut oil, tea tree essential oil, put it in the freezer. Yeah. Make little balls. I mean, you can, you can do a lot of this stuff with just some very basic things that you have in your house. Yeah. H Helen wants to know, would garlic burn inside there? So I don't recommend things that I have not done to myself. So it does not hurt and it does not burn. Um, no. You want an unnicked clove of garlic. So hopefully everyone's mama in here taught them how to peel garlic without actually smushing or cutting or breaking the garlic. Um, that that will work just fine. And people usually ask the same question regarding the tea tree. Oh, will that burn? Yes. If you put it directly on a wound, of course, that's going to burn. But you're using a carrier oil, right? So you're using the coconut oil to carry that. Um, it's actually quite soothing. I know that sounds counterproductive or counterintuitive, pardon me, thinking about that, but it, it's actually quite soothing. So if you've ever had a wound or an infection or whatever, if you can mix it with 
coconut oil. It just, it carries easier in that, in that location than say an olive oil or something. You want it to freeze and coconut oil has that consistency. It'll do that. Um, and so those will work just fine. Yeah. I really expected you to say put lavender on it because <laughs> you, you can absolutely, you can absolutely, if you were making your own, um, I would do a combination of some oils that are going to be antibacterial, antimicrobial, but also equally soothing. And so I would absolutely put lavender in there. I know B and I love our yeah. lavender. So, um, <laughs> that, like, that like oregano. what about like oregano, right? Don't, oregano don't... would be wonderful. Yes. It's also, yeah, because it is so antimicrobial and it, man, it'll kick stuff in the tush for sure. Another thing is, is borage oil. I happen to really love that. Mm -hmm. I've never even heard of that. Yeah. So Helen says, doctors say antibiotics give women yeast infections. Is that true? That is true um, because antibiotics destroy the microbiome of the gut. So when we destroy the microbiome of the gut, then all the things in our body pass, they, they, they don't have their defense mechanism anymore. So someone in here probably has experienced at some point in their life that they've been on antibiotics and then they got sick again right after, but it was a virus mm -hmm. um, well, or they had a really bad issue with, um, you know, allergies or something else with their immune system right after having a round of antibiotics. And absolutely what's going on there is your body we had to wipe everything out in hopes that the good bacteria would come back. So usually my treatment plan for yeast is a probiotic internal and, and uh, orally and internal suppository wise, um, the tea tree combination suppository and a clove of garlic. And I'd say do that for it will, you will feel a whole lot better within about 24 to 48 hours but we want it to be dead. <laughs> so I say a good 10 to 14 days. Cause I, the last thing we want to do is suppress it only for it to come back with a vengeance. And then everything like washing garments on hot, laying them out in the sun. So if you've ever done cloth diapers before, we know that we stick those out in the sun because the sun is the best killer of, of microbes out there. And so that's really important too, is you have to take care of the terrain. Um, I know, I know germ theory is real popular, but terrain theory kind of is my thing. And it's not any different than you gardeners out there. You all know how a garden works. And that is if your soil isn't healthy, you will have bad things grow in your soil. We're essentially not, we're, we're just a huge pile of bacteria. We are more bacteria cells than we are human DNA. <laughs> and that's to keep us all in check. So if you think about the soil that you have outside, if it has a bunch of gunk in there that's decomposing, what comes out to take care of that? Mushrooms, mm -hmm. worms, vermin. What is the purpose? And, and we all get frustrated. Oh, now I've got, now I got, you know, bugs and now I got this and now I got that. Well, the bug isn't the problem. It's a symptom because there's an issue with the terrain. So the terrain is a problem and we have to address that. So yes, I'm giving you very cool tips and things you can use from your kitchen, but that's only taking care of the symptom. We have to figure out, well, why did we have this issue? And when I've been dealing with women in the military, it's because it's a hygiene problem, right? They, they can't go get as clean as they could if they were at home. So we have to address that, right? I have to change to cotton undergarments. We can't be staying in those clothes very long if you get all sweaty. It's just, it's the same concept with, with your hiking or doing any working out or anything like that. You have to change your socks. You can't stay in wet socks. You, you, you'll get trench foot. That, that'll, that'll be a problem. Yeah, so Skane's Girl says uh, guys also get yeast infections. So I would assume garlic and all of those things would have the same effect, right? Yeah, absolutely. For sure. In that case, we'd, 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 it's, it's external equipment, right? So we'd need to uh, do more of a poultice than we would be doing anything internal for sure. Unless, of course, it was somewhere else on the body that wasn't a, a wound of such, of mm -hmm. course. Yes, all of those are great, too. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, let me see here. What else? I got all kinds of questions in here. Oh yeah. Helen one says doctors say eat yogurt every night to prevent a yeast infection. Is that true? So if you're making yogurt at home, 
if you're if you're making real yogurt, <laughs> not, <laughs> not yo play from the store, um, most yogurts, uh, except for maybe two or three on the shelf, are going to be nothing more than sugar laden garbage, and it's dead, right? The the whether it's dairy, whether it's a coconut milk, whether whatever it is, it's been it's it's been pasteurized. So mm -hmm. it's not living anymore. It's 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 a dead food, which really isn't food. Right. right. So that isn't going to work if it's not real. But if you're if you're making stuff in your in your crock pot or your Instapot at home or you're doing it the old school way on the stove um, and you're fermenting it like you would your sourdough starter, then absolutely. That's great. I mean, you don't have to do it every night. That's that'll get boring real fast. But um, absolutely. If you're any fermented food and it doesn't have to be yogurt it can be your fermented sourdough it can be your kimchi your kefir uh, whatever you're doing at home that is your thing um but yes i mean i have i have yogurt in my fridge but it's it's live it's cultured it's it i made it right yeah so this actually is wonderful because you just gave me some firepower to try to convince my wife to make me sauerkraut more often because she makes the best sauerkraut in the world Oh, but I don't get it a lot. You know, she'll make a big batch. We'll eat it out. And then maybe a year later, she'll make another big batch. Oh, but I love it. So we need more sauerkraut in our diet. Yeah. Well, we all from it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love sauerkraut and kimchi and all that. It's yeah. delicious. What yeah. So Bobby, Bobby Spaggs wanted to know what was the number one female prep item? Oh, my gosh. I only can have one. I think you can have at least three. So Bobby's a little slow. Give him three. <laughs> At least, and we're just talking um, gynecological health, like yeah, not female. Yeah, female health. If you have a, um, you so, know, you're in a lights out situation, and you only had three things, what would you want to have with you? I would say that women who are menstruating need to switch to a menstrual cup or disc or something that's reusable um, mm. for sanitary reasons, and then also just for not attracting right if we, we'd have to get rid of all of those things and so that would be hard and it doesn't even have to be a cup it, it could be period underwear like the the panties are great too those are fine i personally rotate through all of that stuff that would be great um and then okay so um that the other thing is i would think picking proper undergarments that are not going to make you sick. So I kind of touched on that just a hot second ago, and that is using cotton, linen, wool, those types of things are going to allow stuff to breathe. And also not strapping all of that, like don't wear all that stuff to bed. You've got to let, you got to let things breathe. Um, okay. So that's two. And then th three. Mm. A really awesome, a uh, really awesome collection of essential oils that you can do cool things with. Yeah. I, I swore you were going to say a catcher's mitt. I swore it. Uh, no, we, we're not doing that. <laughs> you said just women's health. <laughs> yeah, Amy B um, says uh, depends on the stage of life. Is it pre mm. Yeah, pre-menstrual, yeah. pre -menstrual, yeah. menstrual, menopause. Right. Transtecular? Stecular. I don't even know what yeah. that is. What is that? I'm not sure where we're going with that. Transtesticular. Transtesticular. All right. Well, I agree with the first three. <laughs> I have yeah, no idea. So, so caring for young pre, you know, pre um, pubescent girls is also different. So that's a whole different area that has to be taken care of. Oh, so that's a great question. So if you were a family and you were preparing and you had a young girl in your house, what are the three or four things you would always have on hand? Okay. So I love making girls that haven't started their period, their own little special basket. And so there's very particular things I would put in that basket for them uh, to one, just help them not feel intimidated. Uh, most of us ladies have some sort of traumatic story regarding starting our menses <clears throat> that has scarred us for the, the whole entirety of our lives. 
So for me, I like to try to make it not so scary and, and weird for them. So um, peri really cool period panties. The other thing is the reusable pads. So the ones that you can wash are really cool. They have little snaps. They'll go around panties and they come in a zillion fun colors and patterns and cool things like that. Um, other stuff to kind of take care of, of pain. So uh, a hot pack, a reusable like water bottle is kind of cool because they have cool covers on them. And again, you can get this to all fit the things that she's interested in, right? She likes llamas. Cool. We'll just get her a bunch of llama stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So anything that is really nifty, um, it all kind of fits in a really cool bag. And I, I stuff chocolate and fun things in there just to, to make her feel like she's a part of the woman's society, the womanhood, and then also be able to kind of help her not feel overwhelmed and inundated and then not smother her with a bunch of plastic garbage that's out there because there's chemicals. There's a lot, a lot of really bad chemicals that are in disposable items like that. And they do it on purpose that it's supposed to make you bleed longer. So that way you'll use it more wow. what kind of world we live sad, in where, where they create pads and tampons that make you bleed longer what kind of world do we live in that that's happening it's a money thing oh my goodness yeah they're mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it's oh really goodness. gross so what would you now since uh jen brought this up by the way life with mike and jen are very good friends of ours um, absolute firecrackers, love everything about them. But she says, yeah. uh, makes me appreciate menopause. So let's take it to the other side. So you're Ooh. post menopause. Now, what are the three things? Okay. So, so menopause is, is very particular because we need to know was this natural menopause? Was this facilitated by a surgical procedure? Right. So did we, and, and then which type of hysterectomy did we have? Do we have ovaries? Do we not? Do we have one? Uh, it's, that's very intricate and super duper particular. Labs must be done often because we need to watch how the woman is progressing. There's a really horrible, nasty statistic out there that a lot of divorces happen when women are going through menopause and they could be really, they really could be prevented because really what's going on is the poor woman's hormones are completely out of whack and no one can, no one talks about menopause ever. It, it was hardly even touched on in midwifery school. I, I really had to do my own research and learning in my own, just educating myself on that because it's just, it's hardly ever talked about. So you have to kind of figure out how did she go into menopause? And then there's a lot of really great ways to deal with hormones. And a compounding pharmacy would be amazing because they will special create things like different estrogens, testosterones, progesterone, et cetera. They can be creams. They can be dissolvable tablets that go under your tongue, but this will all help. And most of the time, a really good physician who's going to be thinking compound pharmacy is probably similarly minded. And so stocking up on those things would be, would be great. They, they would be easier to do if you were in that situation. Yeah, so let's let's just assume that some of that it's the lights are out and it's a natural menopause that someone's going through. How can we make their life a little bit easier? Um, estrogen. Mm -hmm. So there's so wild yam is a really great way to do estrogen. Um, and that that can be. I would probably prefer it topically for most women because the absorption rate is easier and we put it on our fluffy parts. I'll let you fill in the blanks there tag. Um, but that's usually where it's supposed to go. But what wild yam would be a really great, a really great way to do that. Yes. Yeah, super cool. And so all you people out there who are planting gardens, you know, uh, yeah. which we're going to talk about the grow garden. So maybe I'll save it for that. Right. Yes. We'll, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll save it for that. Um, I'm writing it down right now. 
Um, one more rock says combat midwife. You get the topic of the year, a topic award of the year. Great information that no one wants to talk about. Well, thank you so much. That's so kind of you. And, and you want to see something funny. So we, cause we asked what to do with menopause. What are the things that you would prepare? Carrie Davis says a baseball bat and chocolate. Jen <laughs> says a cast iron skillet, duct tape and a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's really it's really interesting, but the um so think of the 28 day cycle, right? As a as an ebb and flow. So just think of this as baseline and we're doing this, right? We're doing this constantly. You have a new woman in your life every week because she's in a different phase I've of noticed. her cycle. Say again. I've noticed. Yeah. Um, and so that is considered normal. We, we want that. That is all about survival. Um, it, it's biological. It's, it's all about making sure the women species, it, we, we live on this planet and we have to have that cycle. So if this is baseline and this is the normal ebb and flow, I would normally have a, a PowerPoint for this. Um, this is down here is postpartum. OK, it, it's really, really, really low. And then we have people who are going through menopause, which can get way down here. And that can be really scary. And so that's why people will, you know, you'll hear those horrible things like, well, she just went crazy. Uh, no, one, you probably made her that way. And two, she was having a, a significant issue with her hormones. So let's put this into perspective. If someone had diabetes where they're not able to produce or regulate their insulin, everyone in this whole room would go, oh, that's awful. I, I feel so bad for them. We, we need to help them out with their hormone insulin. So they either need to use injectable insulin, they need to adjust their diet, they, they need medications, et cetera. But the moment you say men men's health regarding their reproductive hormones, or you say women's health regarding their reproductive hormones, everybody goes, whatever, you should just learn how to control your emotions. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's our brain. It's our brain that's telling us the whole world is on fire. It's a survival mode. It, women are made, we're, we're, we're weaker than you guys. We have less resources. We are more vulnerable to issues, not only with our own body, but outside of in the world, we are more susceptible in a situation where I don't have provision or protection. And so it is important for us to know what is actually psychologically going on. Remember, the reactions emotionally are a symptom of what is internally happening in the terrain. We have to fix the soil. I love how you equate it back to soil. I really do. You know, <laughs> I've been doing this for years. It's nothing special for you. I wish I could tell you it's special for you, Tech. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I'm, I'm going to pretend you didn't say that. And I'm going to assume it was special <laughs> for me because I'm very sensitive. You know, Jessica, oh, yes, you got to yes, worry. I'm yes. very sensitive. M men are very sensitive. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish I, I wish I could just insert my PowerPoint right here because yeah. I have this little graph. <laughs> hey, I pulled up online because um, we were talking about things we could grow. Um, yes. for um, estrogen for, for get to get estrogen and it says things like flax seeds soy peaches garlic red wine drink some red wine apparently sesame seeds broccoli sesame. brussels sprouts kale carnivorous carnivorous yeah the, yeah carnivorous guys are our friends for regulating hormones yes there's a lot of really great uh pages out there that talk about eating specifically for the the psych the portion of the cycle you're in i like to talk about the the menstrual cycle as a calendar year so winter spring summer fall and and think about how we're what we're doing so in example menses would be winter what do you do in the winter you you close the windows you shut the door you get cozy you you are kind of a recluse. And what's the purpose of that? Again, it's provision and, and protection from the outside elements. Your body is not well. It's bleeding. It's shedding, aligning from the inside. 
where on the flip side to that, summer would be ovulation. So you're, you know, things are growing like crazy. Things are bolting, all that kind mm -hmm. of fun stuff. Yeah. So Ma Masio Parrot, which is a good friend of ours um, from South Dakota, says, what suggestions do you have for someone who is historically estrogen dominant? Oof. I need labs. Um, lots of estrogen. Lots of estrogen. Okay. Is that what that means? Right. So estrogen dominance is kind of an umbrella term. Uh -huh. And it could mean a, a few different things. But what that means is we all have to have a different regulate. Like, in example, men have more to have a more predominant testosterone than women do. Women have testosterone, right? Um, it's it's why we think you're cute as gentlemen. So <clears throat> it yeah, it, it's it's why we it's why we like you and want to procreate with you. Mm -hmm. So we need a certain amount of of testosterone in order for that to happen. But I don't have as much of it, right? We're circling back to our first point here in the evening. What's the difference between a man and a woman? I don't right. have as much as gentlemen do because I'm supposed to be soft and fluffy and I'm and curvy and round and be able to nurture a baby. And I need more estrogen to do that. However, there's also things like fully a follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, there's progesterone, etc. You have to have the right balance of all of those things. But so if your estrogen's way off the chart, I would be wanting to know things more like, um, are we dealing with polycystic ovarian syndrome? And if so, that's a symptom, not a, that's, that's not, a, that's a stupid label that people get that is a cop out. We need to figure out why you're doing that. All right. And we need and we need to get to the bottom of that. So, again, proper labs is is very important. And having a provider, which is not going to be your your Western doctor at all, at all. They don't know how to read those things is finding a naturopath or a Chinese medicine doctor or someone along those lines is going to be able to help you out with that. Yeah, great answer. Hey, Barb says um, that it's so good that you're teaching natural means to get through menopause. Metapos, my GYN put me on hormone medication therapy to get mm -hmm. through it, which later I was told is possibly why I got breast cancer. Answer: Yes, I'm so sorry. I am. Oh, I'm so sorry, Barb. But that's sad. Um, I'm sorry that you got told that because that was horrible for you. Um, yes. Yeah, so the synthetic estrogen is very cancer causing, but it's the, it's very similar to the, the, it's very similar to the synthetic estrogen that's in the pill. Mm -hmm. And that's what causes cancers as well. And so that's absolutely preventable for sure. And we should be teaching women how to take care of this at home. Sorry, I got a little misty eyed. Probably. Sorry about that. Well, it's, it's, it's sad. And, you know, we're fighting this huge battle of a system that's out there to get us at pretty much every single corner, you know, mm -hmm. and so it's just hard. It's hard in a lot of fronts. Um, Tamber said that testosterone and B12 helped her the most when going through menopause. Yeah, those are those can be really helpful. Absolutely. Again, I, I would have I'm making an assumption here. I don't know her, but I would assume that someone probably helped her look at some labs and say, hey, this is what you're low in and this is what you need more of or she was just doing really awesome google searching and, and found some really great people that were talking about that but yes Ooh, yeah. yeah one more rock says hormone disruptors are put in processed foods anything in a bag or a box yeah bags and boxes are bad when it comes when it comes to food this is why reading labels is so important but i'm just preaching to the choir y'all already know that but hormone disruptors go past food so it's the things you wash your clothes in. It's the materials you wear. It's the stuff you put on your face. Absolutely. Yeah. It's the stuff you put on, you know, deodorant, all those fun things. That's that's also a problem. Um, it's the stuff you plug into your walls. If, if I never see a Glade plug-in thing again, it will be too soon. OK, uh, anything that smells nice, that isn't an essential oil, or a in a natural occurring thing is going to be a hormone disruptor. So remember, greenwashing is real. 
<laughs> uh, which means, you know, it may look and appear like it's a natural thing, like Mrs. Myers. Sorry, hopefully I don't get droned down here or anything, but um, that's, that's a greenwashed company. They, they appeal to people and say we're natural and we don't have a lot of gunk in it. That's a true statement. But it's not the whole picture. There's also garbage in that. I wouldn't, wa I wouldn't wash my dishes in that. I wouldn't wash my clothes in that. No, thank you. So being careful with what you're putting on your body is really important. I mean, we could we go back to the Bible and talk about linen and wool, right? So th those are really important things that we're not wearing a bunch of polyester garbage and all that stuff. It's just, those are plastics. That's, that's plastic. You're putting it on your body. Yeah, you know, uh, we've at the house have kind of replaced all of our, um, you know, like what we wash dishes with. Like she uses thieves now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sure. our, toothpaste, our toothpaste is thieves. Yep, uh, yep. Yep, mm -hmm. so those kind of things. But um, I don't, I think you still use <laughs> regular washing laundry detergent, right? No, that's all thieves. That's all thieves too? It's, okay. It's like, she's like, get with the program. <laughs> I've tried like soap nuts, you know, I've yeah. tried making my own i've tried you know through the years trying to but just like you said about the that the one company um if we're told that this is the better one how would we know the difference and if that's not the better one where do we get the better one yeah if you can't pronounce the word on the back of the bottle don't buy it oh good that's advice that's my rule. I took biochemistry. So if you don't know what polymethyl, whatever the heck is, and I do, don't, don't buy that. Um, but it's fun to just, just copy and paste those words and then, and then put them in a Google search and then just watch. It'll say endocrine disruptor, endocrine disruptor, endocrine disruptor. And then that that's disrupting your hormones. The endocrine system is your hormone system. And it's not just your reproductive, right? It's your pituitary gland. It's your adrenals. It's your thyroid, your parathyroid. All of those are related to producing, distributing, regulating hormones. So you could, you could have something that's just attacking, attacking your penile gland. And that isn't necessarily your reproductive organs, but eventually it's going to cause problems. Yeah. Farm Ranch Homestead says, Hey everyone, I tuned in a few minutes ago. And even as a man, I find this interesting. The contaminants in our world are everywhere. So this is good for all of us to hear. Thank you, Combat Midwife. You're so welcome. Thank you for being here. You know, I think um, something you had said in one of the other uh, videos that I had watched a lot is um, someone had asked you a question that really separated, you know, when you're talking about delivery and these things, uh, men and women, and you snapped right back and you said, wait a second. You know, I don't think pregnancy, I don't remember exact words you used, but I, it's not, it's not a her thing. It's a we thing. Oh, and, and so, so Billy, you know, I think that was with Billy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, I just didn't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the men's role in all this. Oh, so I'm a huge proponent of it took two to make this kiddo. So it's going to take two of us to get this kiddo here Earthside, And I just believe that men and women need to work on these things together and being a team uh, rate. If, if we truly believe that a mom and dad are important for rate for child rearing, which I would suppose all of us here agree with, then that starts before the baby is born. Mm -hmm. So that means that having your partner, you're having your husband present during pregnancy, labor, delivery, and postpartum is very important. And I understand that society has programmed us that that men are supposed to just kind of let ladies do their thing. And there is an essence to that, right? The womanhood and sisterhood of bringing forth the next generation. Yes, you want your ladies to rally around you, but they go home. Your mom, your sister, your midwife, like we go home and you and the husband are going to be raising this baby together. So there really shouldn't be any scaredy cat actions regarding going and getting her pads in the other room because she's bleeding all over the place or knowing what the right amount of postpartum bleeding is after a baby is born or understanding some basic concepts of breastfeeding. You know, I, I teach breastfeeding classes and it's nothing but a bunch of women in there. Well, 
he's important too. He needs to know that every time you put that baby to breast, he should be bringing you fresh water, food, uh, you know, propping your feet up, helping you feel good. If we truly believe that women's women's work is women's work and men's work is men's work, then should he not be providing for her? And we get stuck in provision being food and shelter and protection. Well, protection means mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, psychological, right? It means all of those elements. If you can't create an environment in which your woman can flourish and be the ultimate feminine version of her, then are you really manning up is my question. Yeah, I'm waiting to see the thing scroll here. No, on the, yeah. no you're right. You're Perfect. Babe, you, you got all kinds she of. May, she, it makes sense though. She's yeah. she's right. You know, there's there's a lot of guys who don't want anything to do with any of that. So yeah. it. Yeah. But you're right. They they were part of the making and yeah, they're but, part of the rearing. So okay, okay. But I have I have to. Then I'm not going to push back hard right here. I'm going to push back just a little bit. That's great. Bring it. I love it. Yeah. So. Although I think what you said is right. And I think we have to be big boys and step up above it. But there's another side to that, which is because of the way we're brought up. Like I remember when, um, you know, my last child was born, I felt helpless. Sure. I, felt, I felt like I couldn't help. I felt, um, and I was looking for every reason in the world not to be there because I felt sure. so helpless. And, um, and so, you know, I think the good news is B is pretty good and she knows me pretty well to say, Hey, it's okay. And you know, you're going to be fine. And, you know, and, and this, and it's funny, you know, when we, when uh, we had our last child, B handled the whole thing. I mean, a trooper, right, right through, you know, rock star tough. And I'm in the corner with my knees knocking. So, you know, <laughs> it's just not, just, I am not comfortable right there because I can't help her, you know? Right. That looks like she said, help is so much different than right. delivering the baby, you know, right. the stuff. And so, you know, this, the mental support, the emotional support, the, you know, we've got this, not you've got this. See you in 25 minutes, yeah. you know? <laughs> right. I mean, it, it took the two of you to have a physical, mental, spiritual, emotional connection to bring forth an, another life. Mm -hmm. We, we, we believe that there's a, there was a spiritual connection that had to take place in order for that baby to be given to us. So no, I'm not expecting all men to be with a catcher's mitt and same hut, 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 blue 42. That's not what I'm asking. What I am saying is, babe, don't you dare get up. I've got dinner. I've got the other kids. My mom's going to take the big kids to the park. Don't worry about anything. I've cleaned a toilet. I've thrown laundry in. It's the mental load of being a woman because we, our brains never turn off. I am making a laundry list right now. I know what's over there. Okay. I know what's yelling at me right there. You just can't see it in this video. Okay. I know what I have to do tomorrow. We never get to turn our brains off. We don't have the ability of compartmentalizing. It's a big circle. All of the rings fit together. So when a man walks up to you and says, don't, don't worry about dinner. I got it. What do you want? You want a hamburger or lasagna? We love that. Right? We, it's, it's not, it's not, that's not someone telling me what to do or being pushy or bossy or anything. It's me and, Hey babe, I know you're hungry. And I know you, okay, I know you may not be hungry right this second, but you're going to be hungry soon. And I have to feed you because that's my job. So what do you want? And here are your options because she's tapped out, right? She had a, a human come out of her that was eight and a half pounds, the size of a bloody watermelon. All right. And then she's supposed to feed it and she's bleeding and she's gushing fluids from every, nearly every orifice. It's a lot. It, it's just, it's a lot. And there's emotions that happen and 
all these things. So having someone say, I got you, don't you worry about a thing. The toilet's clean, the laundry's done. I've already put the baby stuff in the dryer. There's new sheets on the bed. Go be a mom and let me just sit here and gawk at you, do all this cute woman-y thing. That's, that's amazing. So no, it doesn't have to be, you need to be there catching the little one and knowing all the things. But I think that's where a really good midwife comes in mm-hmm. is a really good midwife is going to look at this event as a couple transitioning from two to three and, and turning into a new era of their partnership. And so there's going to be kinks in the chain sometimes when that happens. And a really good midwife would not make her the center of the event, but would help unite those two. A really good midwife is going to lean over and say, say this exact sentence now, right? And tell him what to say. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've said this. (laughs) Hey, rub her back right here. Okay, I got it. Right. So that is what a good midwife is going to be. We are not asking you to have a new sense of emotional intelligence and read our minds like you've never been able to do in the first place. That's unfair. That's unfair to put that pressure on men. And that's where women come in to take care of women. Right. So that's why things like food chains are really important. And um, we all bring a meal and hey, you know, let me let me help you out with these things or supporting you. Like you talked about you talked about a couple of weeks ago that B was really sick and everybody rallied around you. Mm-hmm. And you were like, I got it, I got it, I got it. And everybody was like, nah, nah, uh, uh-uh. uh, let us do this. Mm-hmm. Receive the gift. And that's what community should be doing. And sometimes we, it isn't our family. Sometimes it's the family we create. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that's what I mean. Um, no, I'm not asking men to do lady things that they're not comfortable with. That, that's unfair to them. Well, but out of our comfort zone is the only place we grow. And so I'd argue to husbands too, you yeah. got to push yourself to those places. But I can tell you when we, you, you had a midwife. Yeah. When, when, she was, she was, uh, at a hospital, uh, right. you know, she right. was, she was just as regulated as a doctor. Yeah. So right. it was she, I didn't get the, the, um, care I think that I would have if I went to like the lady center yeah. to have her. So it was like, um, I think she was very, um, regulated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I actually want to talk about that because Jessica had made a comment in another video about regulated <laughs> versus non-regulated, which I think is awesome. Oh, hey, by the way, Chuck Peoples is in the house and you and I talked about him from Homestead Medical. Oh, hi. And, nice yeah, and so we'll we'll make an introduction out at the Midwest Preparedness Project to you too. Love it. When, yeah. When we're out there. Hey, Chuck, how you doing, buddy? Um, I think what I was talking about, though, was when we were going through delivery, I... I don't know that I was, I don't know how capable I was of saying, what does my wife need? Because I was a freaking mess. And I, and, and Jessica, I'm telling you, I'm a guy's guy. Oh yeah. No, I, I know. A guy's guy. You know, I stuck a 12 inch Phillips screwdriver completely through my hand and it was, I'm not like, come on, deal. not a big deal. It's, I got to get back to work. So I'm, I'm a guy's guy. But yeah. when you're talking about the person in the world, I love the most <laughs> that is I'm helpless to, I can't help her. It's just not a comfortable situation. And so I think right. we as men got to learn to step up above that maybe. And, you know, this is not our time to do that. We got to be a leader and, you know, get out of our comfort zone maybe. But I think this is why having those big conversations beforehand. So it's not scary and overwhelming when you have a baby is so important. What are your, what are your wants? What are your desires? What are your expectations? These are not different conversations than you have in your marriage or should be having in your marriage often, right? The status of the union talks that you should be doing probably nearly weekly in, in, in most marriages is very important. So you should still be having those. It's just going to be a different topic when it, when we're bringing a new baby into the world. So we can all know what our jobs are and what we expect from one another. What happens is women have an unfair expectation of men to read our minds. I am also guilty of this. This is not casting stones. Okay. And so that's unfair. 
Men are not built that way. B and I can have an entire conversation right this second. We've known each other for 40 minutes and we wouldn't use any words and we would know what the two of us were saying because we're women and we're built that way. Y'all don't have those social cues. So it's unfair of that. And we really, really want a really good midwife is going to know this and be able to, hey, dad, what are some things you're scared of? What are some things you want to talk about? What do you feel comfortable doing? What are your no-goes? What are you in no way, shape, or form comfortable doing? Oh, B, that's what you wanted to have done? Okay, is there a sister, a mom, a friend? Should we get you a doula? Like, what can we do to fill that gap so we honor both individuals as a couple? Yeah, there was a comment. Um, uh, Mahomes and Medical says that he's super glad you're talking about this topic. But there was a comment back here that I had up um, right here. The Skeins girl said, teaching our sons not to be uncomfortable is also very important, which is, you know, my dad was a guy's guy. And my dad was, you. I never seen my dad cry a single time his whole life. From, from the time, my earliest memory to the time he was on his deathbed and died, I'd never seen the man cry. You know, and so it's just how we're you know, kind of how we're raised. And so Skane's girl, I think has a super important point here that we have to teach our sons that, you know, pregnancy, a delivery and a UTI is not dirty language. It's not something weird. It's not, you know, yeah. which again, I would fail at miserably, but I'm glad you're here. (laughs) (laughs) You know, yeah. Yeah. What's another question you got on your list, babe? Um, Oh, oh right there. Hot flashes. So what do you do for hot flashes in a post? <laughs> oh yeah. That one. Shit in, in the bad environment. In, okay. We're talking, we're talking menopause again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, geez. I'm just reading her list. <laughs> yeah. I had, so I had somebody who reached out and asked about, um, hot flashes, menopause. And then I had somebody ask about, um, periods, Uh, painful periods in particular, like Mm -hmm. taking things from over the counter, um, mydol or uh, caffeine, Mm -hmm. like things that they could do that would help that would be more natural or easier. So both of those things are a symptom of an underlining problem. I know I'm sounding a little bit broken recordy, but they are just symptoms. So when a woman is having hot flashes, that is not... Yes, that is common. It is not normal, right? We shouldn't, we should be having regulated hormones. So we're not doing that. Mm. So that there's a hormone imbalance issue. So it's a symptom. It's your body saying, Hey lady, I need help. So again, uh, I know you, I know the question was grid down, so we can't go get labs done. (laughs) So I, I would just start playing with different, I would, I would probably jump on estrogen and progesterone first which would be addressed with, like I mentioned, wild yam. One of your other um, patrons kind of said uh, turkey tail, cayenne. Mm-hmm. We'd have to mess with some things. I, I would just kind of be throwing stuff at them and seeing what worked, which is not how I like to practice, but you said grid down. So that's that would have been my answer. The yeah. other thing was painful periods. Periods should not be painful. They should not be heavy. They should not be long and drawn out and you shouldn't be bed bound. And those are all abnormal things. Those are all symptoms of, again, a hormone imbalance. There's something off. So at both of these ladies, I would be sitting down with them and I'd be asking them some pretty important questions, right? Are you getting enough sleep? What are you eating? How much water are you taking? We have to start at the bottom and work our way up. Um, women require at least 10 hours of sleep when they're, when they're menstruating. We, we, we absolutely need more than nine hours of sleep every night. We cannot reproduce and distribute the hormones in our body without having that much sleep a night. We, it's impossible. We can't do it. So, so you talked about abnormal periods. What is normal? Normal is we have to look at things like length Um, cramping is not, so they're, those are common in our culture. It's, it's common to have, so just, I'm using very particular language here. It's common to have cramping and clots and heavy menses. That's very common, but we're surrounded by endocrine disruptors. You know, we've got 5G towers everywhere. We have contaminated water with nothing but the contents of the estrogen 
pill that has not been filtered out, right? We we're drinking all of that. We're getting inundated with all these synthetic things. So it's very important that we get to the foundation. What are you eating? What are you, yeah, what are you consuming? What are you surrounded by? What are you sleeping on? Um, those are all super important questions, right? Mattresses are nothing but a bunch of plastic. Uh, unless you're you're buying things that that aren't made of that material. So again, very very important stuff to just get to the bottom. What's disrupting your hormones? Yeah, that's super interesting because I don't have any idea what that means. You know, I'm a guy, so I figure a period's five days, and that's that, and gave it no more thought after that. It's a bit more complex. <laughs> yeah, clearly, clearly. <laughs> Hormones are too. Men's hormones are complex too. And men's health gets swept under the rug as, as well, right? Natural, natural fibers is the answer to that. So the, the, you know, men's testosterone levels today on average are so low in comparison to 10, 20 years ago, but insanely low in comparison to the men of the 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the greatest generation that volunteered to run off and fight Hitler. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the, when we think about things like infertility issues and um, – mental health problems in the men's community, right? Men are much more susceptible to having really significant mental health issues and suicide. And so we, we have to take all of that in. Um, yeah, there's, we just don't talk about these things. Yeah. Low T is a big uh, common problem for today's men. So eat. what's good? What's good stuff low to eat? Natural stuff to tea. eat. I know what that is. What's what's good stuff to eat for that? Maca root. Um, there's several different kinds of ma and vite uh, vitex for women for healthy cycles as well. But maca root. There's different kinds. And if my mem, I you know I specialize in lady bits. I so know. if memory serves me correctly, it's black. Maybe someone in here is better knowledge, more knowledgeable about that. I'd have to look at my my notebook on that to be accurate, but maca root is really good for men and their health, but it, it's great for women too, but there's two different, there's two different kinds. Yeah. One's for women, one's for men. Yeah. And I don't want to take this conversation away from what we wanted to come talk about because, you know, men talk about men stuff all the time. Girls never, you know, this no, is I, do a lot of guys talk about low T. I mean, Hey, do you got low T? No, 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 I do. You know, no, I don't think. No. Really no, no, we punch each other. Right. I, right. So <laughs> right. But you have four, you have 30 and 40 year old men doing testosterone shots. And I'm not saying they're doing it because they're trying to bulk up, which there are men that do that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about they can't sleep. They are stressed out. They're ha suffering from anxiety, depression. Uh, they can't get, they, they can't get pregnant. Right. So all of these things, and I mean, their wife can't get pregnant. Get somebody pregnant, yeah. The transgender, right? Yeah, I'm saying like they they can't have a baby with their wife because they're testosterone. So they're they're not making swimmers, right? We we those are that's major. Thirty and forty year old men, what forties old now? I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah, because that's, that's just not very old. Yeah. No. Ugh. All right. Yeah. Wait, what else was your next thing on your um, list? Do you, do you have any recommendations on particular books that would help to have uh, on hand to go through some of these items? Um, for, for uh, being prepared for birth or for women's, what are, what are like, you asking? Yeah, well, any, I mean, like if you're like, you know, if I had, if I could only have three or four or whatever books, if you're just like, these are the ones that I would take to the field with me because yeah, yeah I'm going to use as references later. So I would say entry level, just, just getting your feet wet in the, in the shallow end would be heart and hands from Elizabeth Davis. That's a, 
that's going to get you through pregnant. It is my favorite textbook for, for midwives. It's, it's beautifully written. It's just intoxicating to, to read. Uh, I think she did a very good job. It's not textbook like it's more of a, Hey, this is how things work. And this is the beauty of womanhood. I think it's a delightful read. It's my favorite, definitely on my desk. I don't ever take it off. So that one. And then Rosemary Gladstar has a, has an herbal remedy book. There's three of them. There's a women's one, a pediatric, like a kiddos one and a men's health one. I have all three. I love them dearly. They're very entry level into the herbal world. So if that's intimidating to you, if that's something that you're just not familiar with, I would say those things would probably be my favorites. There, the, 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 there's pictures in them. They're just beautifully illustrated. I think they're lovely books. And if somebody was feeling very intimidated by this, that would be, those would be a great place to start. If you really want to get crazy. I mean, I have a, I have post after post after post on my page about books that I love. Mm. So, yeah. And just so everybody knows that we have included all of the links. Um, so to get a hold of the combat midwife, also all of the stuff that she's doing, all of her social media, they're all in the description. And um, I'd like everybody in here to make sure you go over there and subscribe to her YouTube channel and make yeah. sure you support because together is how we're going to conquer the problems that we have out there. So yeah. uh, make sure you take time to go do that. Yeah. We, she mm -hmm. had, um, 352 subscribers before we started. So we're looking for you guys to jump that up. It better at least double. Oh, geez. You guys are too kind. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> um, you had said earlier about an OB kit. Like, what would you do? First of all, do you sell them? And secondly, if you don't, like, what would you put in that? I do have an OB kit. Um, I have the official combat midwife OB kit. It has the bare necessities you need to deliver a baby in the field. It came to be because I was prepping some teams to do some humanitarian and different deployment missions. And there may have been some adult beverages involved, but we dumped out our kits on our bag and said, what do we have in here? You know, it was after hours. They were like, hey, you know, we might have to go do this. We might have to go do that. But we have nothing in their standard kit has nothing to do with women's health. Are there some items that cross over? Yes, there were. But I came up with the bare necessities of what of what you would need. And then my future goal is to come up with a GYN. So non-pregnant female kit and then mm -hmm. a pediatric one and a newborn baby. So it's going to be it's going to be a collection of four or five different kits that you're going to put together. Um, but the OB kit is pretty popular and the guys love it. They, they will, you know, put it in their aircraft or put it in their aid bag or take it with them in their Humvee or whatever, because I just love teaching the military guys. Cause there's always going to be one knucklehead in the class. that's going to be like, oh, I'm never going to have to dilute. This is so stupid. I need to make sure my gun is, you know, lubed up and ammo, 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 blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then it's always weird because then I get the phone call from that knucklehead on a sat phone that said, hey, uh, could you walk me through this again? Or, hey, could you debrief me? I just delivered a baby across the wire, blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, because what you didn't think about is your interpreter has a wife and eight kids. Yeah. If you don't take care of his wife, he's not going to interpret for you. So, you know. There you go. Yeah. So Brett says I've delivered so many animals. I don't see why a baby would be much difference unless there's complications. So how close is delivery of a cow and a, and a human? Well, I mean, so I <laughs> asked this question because I have delivered animal, uh, other animals, other mammals, but I have not delivered a cow, but I hear that you guys put like chains on them and drag these cows. I, please don't do that to human babies. So don't, don't go rev up the Dodge and, um, you know, for it for, we don't need that, but no, there really isn't that much. This is really bad business for me, but no, there, it's really not difficult to deliver a baby. I can teach a five-year-old to deliver a baby. It's really not that hard. 
um, e even with the complex, even with the complications, it's really not that difficult. People freak out about things like nuchal cord, the cord around, wrapped around the neck. That's very, very normal. In fact, most babies are born with a cord wrapped around their neck at least once. Um, think people are freaked out about breech babies. If you can back a trailer, you can deliver a breech baby. You're welcome. Uh, it, it's just really basic stuff. If you understand the concept of backing a trailer, it's very different than backing up your truck into a parking space. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you can't back it up. It's just different. You, you do it differently. And so if you can do those things, you can deliver a breech baby things. There's, there's very, very few reasons. And I've delivered hundreds of babies. I've, I've, I, I just, I can think of on my one hand, the amount of times I've transported because there was actually an emergency. Yeah. Hey, uh, Bobby Spags, if you're still in here or um, Patrick, if you could do me a favor and connect, just send an email and connect Jessica and uh, Chuck from Homestead Medical. Um, so there's a connection there. I think it would be beneficial to both of them. Oh, thank you. That's so kind. I appreciate that. Um, Homestead Medical says complications are very different between human delivery and livestock. <laughs> Thanks for help. Maybe someone can take me to go deliver some cows or something because yeah. maybe I could. <laughs> that'd be great. Maybe I could compare and then it would work better for you guys. Yeah, they come out a lot faster with the tractor than they do with the four wheeler, just so you know. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you for telling me. Please use no engine components <laughs> when delivering human babies. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're very welcome, Chuck. Very, very welcome. Right, so we would like to remind everybody that she's going to be at the Midwest oh, yeah. Festival. Which yep. is so May 7th May through the 12th, um, and there'll be a visit from her out there. I don't know. I don't I don't think you're going to be there the whole time. Which days are you going to be there? Do you know yet? I think uh, I think the plan is like Thursday through this. Isn't it through Sunday? Yeah, well, they're out there all week. So they're there the 7th through the 12th. So what is? Yeah, I think I'm coming in to hang out with you, right? You guys yeah. on the Thursday or something. So I'll probably yeah. be there. I'll fly on Wednesday or whatever and come hang okay. out. So, so I'll do a long weekend. Yeah, so, we'll be, so she'll be out there Friday and Saturday probably. Um, so come out to the Midwest Preparedness Festival and uh, you can spend a little time with Jessica and pick her brain about these, uh, you know, super important topics. Yep. You got a whole list. You want to keep trucking on them? Well, a lot of them she's already gone mm -hmm. through. So let's talk about, yeah, our bees got road down here. Are all midwives licensed or not licensed? Are they all the same? Oh, this is one of my favorite topics. No, they are not all the same. So in the United States, we have several different types of midwives because the United States likes to make things difficult. <laughs> so we have nurse midwives. So those are people that have gone to nursing school and then they went and did four more years of school and got a master's degree in midwifery. And they are nurses at heart that happen to have specialized in birth and babies. <clears throat> so they work primarily in hospitals and they have a very hospital mindset. They're very medically centered and they are supposed to make the hospital money. So you do with that information as you please. Then you have something called a certified midwife. That's an offshoot of this, the nurse midwife. So that's a non-nursing mid. She did not go to nursing school, but she went to midwifery school, but she did it through the Academy of nurse midwives, right? The associated nurse midwives. So I don't know why they did that anyway, whatever. And then there's something called CPM. So those are certified professional midwives. They typically get licensed. So they took a course, they went to school that was approved by that organization and they may have several different types of medical backgrounds or not, right? I'm a paramedic. Um, and then they may, they may or may not get licensed. And then we have traditional midwives and most people don't consider them midwives because they may or may not have gone to tr like a brick and mortar school. And, you know, everybody has their own opinion on whether or not that's OK. I became a CPM because that's just what I was told. Like, that's that's yeah, I was young and that's what everybody told me to do. So I, I did. I followed the, the path um, I had as a paramedic. I would have no desire to become a nurse um, more on that another day. It's just not my thing. It's not my ex. I, I don't like it. I don't want to listen to, I don't take, 
I don't like being told what to do. I don't know if you guys picked up on that. So I don't like dogs telling me what to do. So I just would not be a good, I would not be a good nurse. Um, and I choose not to engage with the government. So I choose not to let the government tell me what I can and cannot do for my mamas and my babies. So I don't subscribe to playing their game. Mm. You can read between the lines on that. Um, and so a traditional midwife is someone that's honoring the tradition of midwifery by considering it as a an art form that gets passed down from one generation to another. Traditionally, you needed to, to be, in order to be a midwife, you needed to have birthed your own babies and a lot of them. And then you needed to apprentice under someone who had also done that and then also delivered the community of babies. And you needed, you were, you were a cute little granny, right? You had beautiful white hair and lots of kids with grandkids and all that stuff because you've been there, done that. Now that's changed obviously with culture and the way we live our lives these days. And I'm not saying that one is better than the other. I think you can be a wonderful midwife and have not had children personally. Uh, it's different, obviously. And I just like I believe that you can be a wonderful brain surgeon and not have needed to have brain surgery done to you. That's my personal belief. There are many people that have other beliefs on that, and that's okay. They're entitled to that. But that's um, what I try to subscribe to as well. I, I became a CPM and I maintain that. I choose to practice like a traditional midwife. Good answer. Hey, Amy B wants to know, Jessica, do you have to deal with SANE exams and or female post-trauma care? Is that part of the medical training? That is an additional certification. So the so for those who don't understand that sexual assault nurse examiner is what that stands for. And okay. that's an additional certification. I personally have done my own education on that because more women than not have been sexually assaulted at some point in their lifetime, whether it's early on in childhood or the amount of cases of geriatric sexual assault would sicken you. So it is for me, I have done a lot of research and a lot of training in that personally, but it was not part of my midwifery education simply because, or not deep enough as it should have been, that would be a better way to say that, simply because birth will trigger sexual assault. Because birth is the culmination of a sexual act, whether it was positive or negative. So that that may have been a positive experience with that new partner, that new husband, whatever. It may have been beautiful and you brought this new life into the world. But if you have not dealt with that trauma in the past, it will rear its ugly head during birth, even though that is the past. Our brain does not work that way. It does not have the ability to compartmentalize N trauma in general in both genders does not. So it can be triggered at any time. So if there's been a trauma, birth in a sexual nature will bring that up so that I talk about that often during prenatal appointments. Yeah, um, you know, Brett says birthing is 95% natural and only needs watching people make it complicated through non-mental toughness, bring on the haters. But I, I think this brings up a really, really good point because when you're in an event, uh, should hit the fan event or the lights have gone out or whatever, and you're dealing with this in your home. I know you have some advice for how people handle the anxiety of that, right? We're trained. We go to the doctor. We're trained, you know, and, and you, you had made, yeah, yourself. you had made several comments about 90% of it's in your head. And mm -hmm. I'd love to have you touch on that just a little bit, Jessica, because I think that's super important. I think anything in life is going to be mo is going to be mental in order whether that you're learning a new skill right it, it nobody just says well tomorrow I'm buying a homestead I'm getting six llamas and it's just gonna work okay like that doesn't make sense most people don't do that someone is going to deep dive everything they have they, they could ever know about you know, alpacas, whatever, sheep, whatever they're doing, 
you're going to deep dive into that information and you're going to learn all the nuances about it. And I understand that this is not everybody's cup of tea, just like knowing everything about prepping or homesteading is really not my thing. There's certain things about prepping and homesteading that I'm like, that is so freaking boring. Yeah. I'm glad that so-and-so is really good at it and yeah. I can just buy his thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm going to take it. I'm going to put it in my cupboard and it's just, I, okay, great. I watched a couple of classes. I know how to use it. Fine. It's just not my thing. Um, and I, and I get that. So that's why just spending some time on realizing that you're, you're really smart. You're smarter than you give yourself credit and you really do have instincts that are God given. And if you just tap into those things, you'll be just fine. It's when we don't listen to them that feces hits the oscillating device. So it's important that we remember if we have our head in the game, then we can we can do a lot of really cool stuff. We can do a lot of hard things, too. I, I would assume at some point the viewers have, have watched some sort of apocalyptic end of the world, military movie, whatever. And there's going to be that scene where something goes awry mm-hmm. and people just rally around and they just figure it the frick out. They just figure it out. And and we've got to remember, you, you know, most of the our grandparents and great grandparents who had these beautiful farms and all these animals and they were making all this food and doing all this stuff. Most of them had sixth, maybe eighth grade education. So, (laughs) and they had 12 kids, right? That were all born at home and they had wonderful lives and breastfed all of them and did all these things. It's when we start telling people, well, you have to have this baby item and you need to buy all these things and you have to do this stuff. And we start telling women and men to stop listening to your instincts. You know, it's like the thing where we start demonizing bed sharing and co-sleeping with your baby. You are supposed to be inseparable from your child. But yet we've demonized that. Why? So they can sell you a crib, so they can sell you a pack and play, so they can sell you a bassinet, so they can sell you the sheets that go on the bassinet and the bumpers and the this and the that. They want you to consume. It's not about safety. And so th- tapping back into your normal, natural ability to know what is right and wrong and trusting your instinct, that will get you. That will, that will just that the sky's the limit at that point. Yeah, you know, Will be a buddy of mine. Will be cool says uh, I had an MD tell me he works at a hospital. Mm-hmm. But I had an MD tell me that the majority of cesareans are unnecessary and they can charge more. Yeah, a, a C section in 20, 2010, 2012 started at fifty seven thousand dollars. So what do you want to sell more of? It takes three minutes to cut her open, get a baby out, and five minutes to sew her up. Do you want to sell those or do you want to sell twelve hour births? that are vaginal and she's got to walk around and you've got to be there the whole time and all that. So it's, it's a money making scheme. It's the medical industrial complex that is out to get us and we need to leave it. I don't want to play their game anymore. Yeah. And good for you. And I applaud that. Um, That's crazy. $57,000 takes less time. What's, what does a vaginal birth on average cost? Uh, Again, these are 2010, 2012 numbers. It was 10 grand. Yeah, so it'd be twenty grand now, and the fifty-seven thousand would be one hundred fourteen thousand. Sure. Right, right. By you know, by now, uh, Beth Emily says my mother was one of twelve born on a farm in Kansas. That's a that's a real cool that's a real cool story. I, I would I, that's amazing. Yeah, and we do more of that. <laughs> something that we didn't talk about that I think super super critical is sanitation, and. You know, when we get into that type of uh, a stir environment or, you know, the lights go out or whatever it is, is there some things that we would be keeping for a sanitation perspective of childbirth, you know, g- girl issues? Okay. Uh, for birth? I like that one. You want that one? Okay. Yeah. Well, you're going to laugh at me because I bury placentas in the garden and uh, it's real good for your garden it'll make your tomatoes go crazy and when women have babies in like in a birth pool and such 
I, I use my sump pump and I put all of that in their garden. So if they don't, if they don't have a garden or whatever, and they just have grass in the front yard, I, I dump all of it out there because it will grow like crazy. I have a particular mom that we still stay in touch and she goes, my tomatoes for years have been amazing because you put my yeah. water out there. <laughs> so wow. she, she just thinks that's hilarious. And we giggle about it. She, you know, she reminds me of the birth of the baby and all that fun stuff. And we just giggle about it. So yeah, it, I just dump all that stuff out in the garden and it's the same thing like you would do with a composting toilet, right? Mm -hmm. You have to have the same process of breaking all that stuff down and then, and then you just put it in your garden. So you could put it in your compost pile if you wanted to, but yeah, I tell I tell women that if they don't want to save and consume their placenta, then they should put it in they should put it in their garden. You know, when we talk about uh, sanitation, I think there's another side to this though too is is that the chances of being able to live a sanitary life in that type of environment probably aren't great. So I would imagine that you would see increased yeast infections, increased UTIs, increased probably complications from childbirth maybe, right? Because you don't have the uh, <laughs> sanitary conditions we would have today if we were to do it at home or whatever it is. So is there anything else you would add to the, that list? Well, it's not being in, in as clean of environment. Well, I don't know that. The, I think there would be at first because the learning curve for most individuals okay. would be difficult. However, if we went back, I mean, women weren't dying from yeast infections in 1860 mm. in the wild west. Mm. Good point. Okay, so what we have to understand is that these are really new problems. These are first world problems. And women aren't dying in, you know, sub-Saharan Africa from UTIs. They know how to fix those things. They all, because they also know how to avoid those things. Yeah. So we have to kind of think about it from that perspective. I mean, women took baths maybe once a week. Mm -hmm. They washed their hair every couple of weeks, maybe every month. So it's it's just a different lifestyle than what we're used to here, right? Where we shower every day and we strip our body of our, my, our external microbiome. You know, our skin is our largest organ and we strip it every day. I'm guilty of it too. I'm just as guilty as it. This is not me judging. I am just as guilty of this. Yeah, Jen says my daughter-in-law's um, midwife freeze-dried her placenta to put in capsules for her to take. Never heard of that before. Placental encapsulation is pretty cool. It's an old Chinese custom that has been around. It's part of Chinese medicine for millennia, and it's it's pretty it's pretty interesting stuff. A lot of women say that it helps them avoid or manage postpartum depression, which mm -hmm. is. Uh, that's a life that's a lifestyle problem for sure that that is we create but it can also be hormonal and then um isolation will make people go crazy and a lot of times women just get left alone because they've just had a baby and they go they go crazy i mean you spend all your time inside talking to a thing that doesn't talk to you back that that can make somebody go crazy um and so yeah it can help out with hormone regulation milk production so it can help with uh the lact lactation hormones, prolactin, mm -hmm. and help with releasing that. So that can be very helpful, especially in a grid down situation. You could absolutely still do that in a grid down situation. You would just use the sun to dehydrate it. Yeah. So, so what do people do in those types of environments with birth control? Ooh, I love this topic. Mm -hmm. So birth control in was a couple different ways. So obviously barrier methods, there were many types of, of condoms back in the day that worked well. Um, sheepskin was the first kind of conglomerate of that. And then they still make sheepskin condoms today. And then the other thing is a, a barrier method, like a sponge. And so they would use sea sponge and then soak it in different herbs and things that would be act as spermicide and then insert that as a way to create a barrier. Um, and so if all of those things are like, wow, that's, that's really disgusting, Jessica, I get you. So we have things that are different types of barrier methods. So we have um, diaphragms are really great and you can get some really great ones even for like 100, 150 bucks. 
that are amazing. And I would say that everybody, if you have women in your family, and it, even if you have daughters that are going to, you're like, but they're not a childbearing age. Yeah, I get that. Um, but for me personally, I, I would make sure that there were, there was a barrier method that I made sure they were wearing when they were outside. Because if we're talking about a true grid down situation, um, they're very susceptible to, to rape. And mm -hmm. so we need to be thinking about not adding to that trauma. And so that, that would personally, I would not be letting my daughters go get water, you know, as an example, if they weren't maybe taking care of that. The other part of that is knowing your cycle. So natural, uh, like natural family planning is what it's been called for years. But, you know, that's kind of your, that's the kind of your mom and grandma's, you know, the bead method and the charting method, like just the, it's called the calendar method. But what I like to teach is fertility awareness method. So it's called FAM, which I think is cute because it's, you're planning out your family, mm -hmm. but it's looking at temperature, charting on the calendar. So the days of your, you're doing things, cervical discharge and cervical placement. So it's those three things, temperature, cervical discharge, and cervical placement. And in women knowing when those things are happening and how that's happening, um, that that's invaluable. Cause you, you can narrow it down to like a couple days of a window of when it's possible that you could conceive. And that's very important if you're trying to avoid, or if you're trying to have a baby in a grid down situation. And it's something that all women should be learning. Oh, I'm going to add a book then take charge of your fertility. That is an amazing book. It is very big. It can be really overwhelming. You do not have to read it from cover to cover. I would use that more of a, as a reference guide if it was intimidating to you. But I truly believe that every woman, that also goes in your little girl's basket um, when she's started her menses. It should be read together with mommy. Um, maybe even toss dad in there if he if, is so inclined, but really educating her. This is what your body is doing. This is why it's happening. That is the owner's manual to women's bodies. Take charge of your fertility is, is it's legit. I, I There's no way I could do better. She did a really great job. Yeah, love that. I wrote every book you've mentioned I've wrote down. Well, perfect. Um, I'm real big on, on having a big library. You know, I, I, love, I love books too. Yeah. It's my addiction. Yeah. So when you go to the um, Midwest Preparedness Project, are you going to have some OB kits with you? Because I'd like to buy one. Yeah, I can absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'll have all the fun things, the T-shirts and the fun stuff. It'll all come with me. OK, too. So make make sure you bring one for me. So we'll, we'll definitely buy one. And many of the people who are in this chat tonight will be there. Yeah, I yeah, I'll have shirts and all the fun swaggy stuff, the stickers and the patches and hats and all the OB kits. Yep, they'll be with me. OK, cool. <laughs> Excellent. So let's talk real quick about food forests. Oh, well, yeah. This might be something that you, you maybe don't talk about a lot normally when you're doing interviews and those things. But <laughs> tell everybody on the chat on the on the live, just I'm gonna tell you a real, real, real brief story. So um, I got in contact with Jessica through the Midwest Preparedness Project. And so that's how we made the connection. And, and they were talking um, and Bobby Spag says, I've got a buddy you got to meet because Jessica and I line up a lot when it comes to getting out of the system and and those kind of things so anyway we were having this conversation and as you guys know i've got a food forest that we're working on being uh you know uh designed here at my place and uh we have lindsey brandon coming out from food forest abundance to do a site walk through at the same time lucky me that we have the combat midwife in the house and and so anyway when her and i were talking the idea came up is why don't people plant girl gardens you know, why don't we plant gardens that, that include things for menopause or include things for childbirth or include things for, you know, those kinds of infections or whatever that those kinds of things are. And um, so Jessica said to me that this would be a fabulous idea. And then behind the scenes was talking to Lindsay and all that. So I'd love to hear how your conversation went. Oh, it was so great. Well, first of all, I'm super impressed that you came up with that being, being a guy and a man's man at that, right? You were, it was your idea. You're like, man, we need a girl garden. And of course, as mushy as I am, I got misty eyed on the phone. Cause I was like, that was such a cool idea. You're ruining the image. 
<laughs> what an amazing, what an amazing idea. So I think that's wonderful. And then you told me I needed to chat with beautiful Lindsay. She's such a cool person and what a warm heart. And she was just thrilled. So we had some really great chat and we talked a lot about like what it would physically present, like how it would look mm -hmm. and how I said, I, I really wanted it to all come together because each individual in the family is valuable. The, mm -hmm. the, the man is important. The woman is important. The children are important. And when you don't have those different elements, it, it can work. But it's it's not the way it was designed and intended. And she goes, oh, I know exactly how we're going to, you know, build this. So it's aesthetically representing the, yes. the family as a whole. And of course, I'm getting all goosebumpy. <laughs> we were just, oh, I mean, we probably would have been hugging each other if we were in the same room because it was just such a cool conversation for her to take. It was really, it was really your image. And then you just taught, you punted it to me. And then I kind of ran with it. And now Lindsay is taking the words that I was saying. Cause she's like, just keep talking. I have to write images. Like I have to mm -hmm. turn this into a vision of tangible vision. So I just kind of shared with her what my beliefs were and what I think, how, how I view the family and how important it is and how the woman is supportive of the husband and the husband protects the, it was just, it was really cool. So she's got some, I'm not sure what we're going to see. It's going to be neat though. Yeah. I'm, I'm super excited. And I, I love the idea of, um, you know, putting um, that monument to honor the amazing, wonderful, beautiful creatures women are. And, oh. you know, I, I tell people all the time that we're not equal and we're never going to be equal. We're worth the same, but yes. I have things I'm good at. She has things she's good at. And, the world has taken from women what make them queens and what yeah. make them, you know, special and what make them was something that we should be honoring and we should be putting on a pedestal. And right. um, and I practice that in my life. And you can ask my wife, I, she's my, my queen and that's the way it is. Um, and so I'm really excited to seeing how this turns out. I don't really know. You know, they're designing, they're going through, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So I'm super, super excited about it. And I can't tell you how thankful I am and how blessed I am that you would contribute to such an important thing that's going to impact thousands of people over the next few years. I mean, how cool is that? That's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm super, 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 super excited about that. Um, what else did I have on my list? We talked about the girl garden. Well, you know, we've been at it an hour and 30 minutes. Who else has got some more questions and we'll get those out and then uh, we'll get everybody on the way. Hey, by the way, Barb wants to know where's the Midwest preparedness project at it's in Kansas. So it's at yeah, Clinton Lake, Lawrence, which would be Kansas. basically Lawrence, Kansas. If you want to look it up. Um, is where it will be. So you guys know it is within 15 minutes of everything. So if you need a place to eat, it's 15 minutes. If you need a hotel, it's 15 minutes. Now, most people will camp. Most people will, um, you know, stay in an RV. Now, me and my wife, we come back every single night because we have animals to deal with and all of those kinds of things. And I'm super excited because Jessica's going to stay with us for a little bit. So how cool is that going to be? Um, but, uh, okay, let's see what we got here. Um, one more rock says. Oh, sorry. I'll get back to that one. One more rock says, does anyone believe that men also go through cycles? Yes. I do. I'm the, I'm the same every day. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that that is true that men go through cycles too. Cause I, there's days I've been more motivated than others. There's, you know, I'm sure all that's true. That's the next, that's the next live. I'll talk about that. The next live. Yeah deal what's this one i just planted i have no idea what that is just chinese yam um is yeah. the wild yam that will help with menopause yes it's uh send me an email i'll double triple check for you okay do you could you want to share your email it's ask at combat midwife.com ask? Ask, like a s k it's yeah. it's in, it's it's in the notes i gave you today okay I'll just stick it in there because there it is. Yeah, like ask me a question and then oh, there, there you, go. Yeah, you got it. So I know that a lot of this stuff can be really overwhelming. And I know we we kind of cherry picked a lot of different conversations today, but I will come 
teach a class for your organization or group. So if you if you want to learn some of these things, but maybe can't be at the places that I'm going to be at, I've yet to say no to an organization, which is a good or a bad thing. I'm not sure. Um, and then I also am working diligently, really, really hard right now to take every course I teach and and put them online so you can just purchase them there and take them at your leisure or have access to them so you can keep learning. Because I know that it can be really difficult. We're all scattered all over the country. And we got kids and families and things and work and animals and all that stuff. And I, I am, I'm very sympathetic to that. So I am make, I am making it accessible. These things that I've only been teaching them to the medical professionals and the military medical guys. And so I want, I am desperate to get it to you. I, I want you to have it because you deserve to be out of the system in its entirety, not just water, not just energy, not just animals, not just food, but I want you to be able to take care of your family and not need me. That's my whole goal is I should not be needed. I, I want you to have it. You know, Jessica, I'll tell you, you would be an absolute blessing to any community. And, uh, you know, I got a just a crazy idea. You know, we're building a community building and we've got this food forest going in. So when we get the girl garden installed, I would be honored <laughs> to have you come down and teach the class with all of the stuff you talk about growing right there next to you. Oh, yeah. Let's do that. That's so fun. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be like super cool. Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, 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 put, it, we'll put it down there. Well, hey, Jessica, again, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I'm going to see you here shortly. Everybody in the, in the chat tonight, listen, go over, subscribe to Jessica's channel. Let's help her grow because the information she has is super important. It's super neglected. Us men got to figure out how to get out of our comfort zone so we can actually grow because we are a partner in all of this and um, we owe it to our spouses to support them and to protect them from that yeah. level as well. And so I will work on being better about that too, right? <laughs> because we, we all get to grow and um, I think it's awesome. But uh Jessica, thank you so much for coming in tonight. And we're going to do it again sometime. You know, I've got some ideas coming up about doing a, you know, maybe some freedom podcast that's got, you know, some of the specialties all involved in it, you know, and, and so that would be pretty cool too. So um, I really appreciate it. Thank you for taking time and thank you for making all of us smarter. Thank you. I'll polish my tinfoil hat. Please, thank you I'll so much. I'll make one. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me. You guys are a blessing in my life more than I can tell you. So thank yeah. you. Awesome. We'll talk to you very, very soon. Bye. Yeah, see you. Bye.